All right, so that uh, segues right, uh, right into our first presentation, which is pre-purchase surveys. Um, and Eric Smith, is, uh, Smith Yacht Sales, is, has, just so happens to be the Yaba president. He's been in the marine industry since 1990, CPC, Certified Professional Yacht Broker, CPYB, designation as well as holding his 100-ton uh, captain's license. Serves on the board of directors, president of the Yacht Brokers Association of America, uh, and a member of various trade associations, well qualified. I'm gonna leave that to him to come on up here. Eric Smith, come on up, and then uh, I'll leave the introduction of the panelists to you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, as Bob was saying, my name is Eric Smith. I'm with Smith Yacht Sales in Hingham, Massachusetts. Um, as our brother and fellow broker, Ronnie McTagg refers to myself and fellow Bostonian, Mike Scalise, as chowder heads. That would be a lot funnier if he was here right now, sorry. Uh, as the president of the Yacht Broker Association of America, I want to extend my thanks to Paul Flannery, uh, the EBA Board of Directors, both EBA and YABA support staff for organizing this event, as well as continued collaboration between the two organizations, which as far as I'm concerned is so important and we're so excited, but it, obviously it strengthens both of us, so that's great. Uh, this morning I'll be moderating a panel of, chowder, uh, a panel of experts on the topic of pre-purchase surveys, and now I'd like to introduce the panel of experts. Uh, the first is David Moss, a board-certified maritime lawyer and shareholder at Ali Moss Rogers in Lindsay in Palm Beach, Florida where he focuses practice on yacht transactions and operations. So welcome to David. Uh, our surveyor, George Zietler, has an extensive maritime background in many different roles in the South Florida maritime industry. These have included a tour as the Chief Vessel Inspections U.S. Coast Guard Sector Miami, School Chief of uh, Principal Surveyor for the Classification Society, uh, VP of Operations for the Cruise Line Startup Bahamas Paradise. He's a graduate of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, studied naval architecture, combined strong blend of shipboard operation experience, extensive technical knowledge, and impressive regulatory compliance record. His name is well known throughout the Caribbean maritime community um, and is critical in improving the safety of ships in operating in the region. Now my Boston guy, Mike Scalise. Uh, boating is in Mike Scalise's blood. He grew up in Weymouth, Massachusetts at the boatyard his family still owns today. After graduating from the University of Rhode Island with a bachelor's degree in marine affairs, Mike moved to Fort Lauderdale where he started out washing boats for Allied. Uh, he has his 100 ton captain's license, ran a 100 foot west ship and a 46 Merritt. Um, he went on a uh, private sport fish vessels, becoming the fleet captain for Lazara. Uh, today, HMY is proud to have Mike as a member of their expert team. His knowledge, passion, and dedication to his clients are well known throughout the industry. He's an HMY perennial top performer. Um, and my favorite part is you can see him cruising his classic restored 28 Mako Nautical. Right? Yeah. All right, so this is kind of an exciting process. I've been on panels before. I've never moderated a panel. I'm a total greenhorn, but I, I had the benefit of having a conference call with this team, and we brainstormed, and we put together questions that we thought would be appropriate for newcomers to the industry and people that have been in the industry forever, and obviously we're looking for your participation as we go through it. Uh, so the first part is kind of a two-part question. Um, as we know, everything is a process. And I drill that in with our guys at work, and the more that you stick to a process, the less likely you are to get into trouble. So we came up with two great talking points to start, um, and this is good from both surveyor broker perspective, but what is necessary to get a boat ready for survey is part one, and part two is what's necessary to 
get your clients ready, both, both buyers and sellers. These are really important things, and I think, again, setting expectations is such an important part. So why don't we start with, uh, with George. What is your perfect scenario that you roll into and we're ready to rock and roll? Uh, I'm not sure that there's a perfect scenario uh, because I've yet to run into one in 30 plus years of doing this. Um, most, as most of you have experienced, most of our surveys are gonna take uh, three phases. Some sort of a haul out for underwater inspection of running gear, bottom and things like that. A trial run, uh, preferably offshore for boats that are designed to be offshore, but not, that's not always possible. And then a third phase of in-water testing and operation of equipment uh, alongside the dock typically. So some of the typical uh, headaches that we run into, uh, communication ahead of time. Where is the haul out gonna be done? Uh, is there an issue with getting the boat, the yacht, to that appropriate location where it can be run. Uh, Fort Lauderdale is a great example. You're up at Lauderdale Marine Center, you gotta be towed two hours down the, the New River and then proceed from there. So what can be done, what needs to be staged ahead of time. Um, for boats that are uh, maintained in the water, uh, most surveyors, especially with fiberglass, are gonna look for pressure washing. That needs to be done ahead of time uh, so that we can uh, take a close look at the, uh, the fiberglass and, uh, or the steel even. Um, so that's, that's a planning process ahead of time. For fiberglass boats, if, uh, if there's a desire for, I'll use the inappropriate term of moisture meter testing, um, do we, we need the hull to be dry, so that means if it's gotta be cleaned, that needs to be done probably 24 hours ahead of, of the survey, uh, so that the hull can be dried out and ready to, ready to check with, uh, with meters. Um, uh, smaller boats uh, that are in the, say, up to 50, 60 foot range, uh, some surveyors are hesitant to inspect the underwater part of the boat while it's still in slings. So does, does the surveyor require blocking? Uh, if so, what, does that, what is that gonna take? Uh, do they require jack stands? So that's all part of the communication ahead of time. Uh, the next thing I talk about is extraneous belongings. Uh, many times we're, we're opening and, and climbing through compartments and, and things on uh, storage lockers and there is a ton of personal belongings that have no part in the transaction itself, still on board. That hinders the inspectors or the surveyors ability to see within areas of the, of the, the hull. Uh, and uh, uh, as part of that, whether or not the spaces are locked. So if you're, uh, if you're doing this, say Mike is the listing agent, you're communicating that to Mike, hey, make sure, are you giving him like a, a punch list before the day? So the way I normally run my surveys is that when, my, when uh, my, most of my clients are the buyer, mm -hmm. uh, the buyer reaches out, we, we negotiate a deal, I send him or her my contract, as part of that will be an email with a list of these questions or steps that I, that I want to, to take uh, or that need to be done to prepare the boat. Um, and so that's done ahead of time and I expect for my, initially for my client to communicate that to the uh, broker or brokers that are involved in, in, the, in the deal. Um, once the contract is signed, if my client wants me to, to coordinate directly with the broker for getting these questions answered, that's, that's all well and good, and we'll do that. Um, and then who, um, so one thing that over the years has been a hot, we don't use this term sea trial anymore, but trial run. So who dictates where the boat's going for the trial run and also where it's going for the haul out? Uh, that is left to um, 
the seller and the buyer to negotiate be between them what, what is going to be done. Um, you know, there, with the trial run, ideally we want to see uh, a full test of the operational capability of steering and propulsion systems. Uh, we're going to want to see multiple speed runs, ideally uh, up current, down current, or upwind, downwind, so that we can check fuel consumption and things like that and document those, those data points. Um, if the boat is designed to be sailed offshore, ideally we want to go offshore, uh, but that's not always possible. But, but as far as the surveyor is concerned, uh, they're typically going to express how, what things that they want to see during the trial run, mm -hmm. uh, and they leave it up to the captain and I, uh, eventually the, the seller as to where the boat uh, or yacht gets, uh, gets operated. Okay. And Mike, you're in agreement, so when you're, you, what is your process when you're getting your seller ready for, uh, for survey? Yeah, the, the process should start when you get the listing. So you can avoid all the potential pitfalls of, you know, the week before, the day before, the day of. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a real seller, declutter the boat. If they're not cruising the boat, get personal belongings off. Nobody, no buyers, whether you're showing, they don't, they don't want to see, you know, toothpaste on the sink and bars of soap in the shower. Um, so, you know, get all that stuff off. If they're not, if they're not using the boat anymore, the committed sellers, get rid of all that stuff and it should start early. Um, Pre-sea trial the boat. There's nothing better than a pre-sea trial sea trial. Mm -hmm. You know, avoid getting yourself into an area where there's going to be question marks. Um, I try to incorporate, when you have a really good seller, um, get the boat, uh, get the boat surveyed beforehand. For, for 2000 bucks, you get the listing, you can prepare your customers with an in-house survey, in water, real simple, you know, get the punch list and identify potential deal breakers way ahead of time so that it's not a surprise. That's really interesting. How, how often with a seller do you get them to agree to that? Not as much as I'd like, yeah. um, but when you, put, when you frame it in a way that, well, let's, let's spend 2000 bucks, get an in-house survey done, that's our property. We don't have to share it with anyone. It's just for us. Right. We can identify any potential pitfalls ahead of time, fix deal breaking items so that everything goes smooth on survey. You're going to spend 2000 bucks. It could save you 10,000, 30,000 on survey adjustments. So set those expectations and before the survey, you know, have the boat clean the day before. Have, the bot, have a diver on the boat so that you don't haul it out of the water and have to pressure wash it. You shouldn't yeah. have to pressure wash it. The bottom should be clean. You know, acid wash the wheels, if anything, on haul out so you get all your RPMs. Knock out all that stuff ahead of time. Prepare your sellers the right way. Um, and you avoid all those, you know, you, you, you avoid so many potential issues yeah, by, agree. by doing that stuff ahead of time. Good points. David, yeah. can Mike, without... The owner's permission just hand that survey off to anybody? No, I mean generally the, the owners are looking for, sellers are looking, both buyers and sellers are looking for recommendations as to surveyors, but the decision is ultimately theirs. I mean mm -hmm. unless the, the client tells you hire whoever you think is best, that, that's the decision that they have to make. Okay, good point. A couple other comments, Eric, uh, and uh, as, as Mike said, the Pre-sale survey is something that we don't see nearly enough from the surveying side either. Uh, the other thing that it helps with in the long run is uh, setting a realistic listing price. Uh, you know, to, there are times where I've been involved in, in cases and talked with other surveyors that have had similar experiences where you come on, come on a boat that's $150,000, $200,000 uh, on the listing or the sale price, and when the surveyor does the valuation, we're fifty, sixty thousand dollars below that, and now we're now everybody is is looking at this as a negative exercise. So that that's that's a uh, for for boats, especially unique boats that have that are one offs or or maybe classic or or uh, um, um, antique style boats. 
those types of things would be would be a big benefit. So this is a good, this is kind of a hot topic for me and Mike on this call is that to George's point, you have the boat on the market for a certain price, it goes under contract for a certain price, and then the survey report comes back with a much lower value. So why is that? Could be negative, obviously, the person's financing the boat and it's under contract for a million bucks and the surveyor says it's worth 700 and now they, you know, the bank won't allow that. So one of the things that we were trying to talk through that uh, Mike brought up is why is, can you, is there a negotiation? Like if the boat has a recent sea keeper, new electronics and it's been repowered, are those things worth more money to, to be value add for the sale price of the boat? In some instances, yes. Some instances, it is. Uh, it, it, add, it some of them will add value to the boat when you start going with extra, uh, significantly upgraded electronics, uh, things like a sea keeper stabilizer. Those types of things will definitely add value to a boat. Other times, it is nothing more than maintenance. Uh, you're you're uh, refreshing. Uh, you've got an outdated. 15-year-old Furuno uh, electronic suite that is no longer, no longer produced, no longer spare parts, and you come in and put in a new Garmin system, the exact same uh, pieces of equipment, you really haven't improved the boat. You haven't added value. You've just restored it to a, uh, a current boat. Okay. One other thing, if I can, Eric, also yeah. that we didn't talk about... Um, on this topic is a recent trend we're seeing uh, with a lot of marinas is the requirement that uh, the surveyor have the marina put on their general liability policy as a named insured. Uh, that causes a lot of delays. Uh, again, goes back to why it's, it's important for the surveyor to get the name, address information on the haul out in particular ahead of time. Um, there's some, uh, some marina operators and, and some of the marina associations are really pushing this idea that they have to be named insured. And that raises an issue since many of the insurance companies and underwriters charge the surveyor to have, them at, have these companies added. So who's covering that cost? Is that going to be passed on or is the surveyor bearing that cost? And how do, um, when you get to the survey point, you're setting the expectation with the customer of the different expenses. And one thing, again, this is why I'm excited about the collaboration, but where we are up north, survey expenses are typically by the foot. And we've had to educate ourselves by fire, knowing like if you're doing a deal in South Florida, it's charged uh, potentially by the day. So it's all about setting the expectation for now your buyer. So, Mike, can you speak? We talked about the seller's expectations, but what are you doing to set the expectation for your buyer? Maybe it's not your listing, but you're going in and you're managing that process. So how are you setting that expectation with your buyer? Um, so you take the boat and you know if the buyer's buying, say, like, um, you know, a 20-year-old Viking, for example, you want to set the expectations to a point where you know, I've surveyed enough of those boats to know the potential pitfalls and things that could come up. So if you talk about those things early, control the message, then um, make them aware of, you know, you know, the moisture meter comes out. But if you have that conversation before where, you know, 20-year-old 20, 20 Viking with a cord hull, you know, don't be surprised if we get uh, some moisture around um, rod holders or cleats. It's a 20-year-old cord hull, and that's going to happen. So if you say that and control the message early, it's not a deal breaker. It's not a surprise when it happens because it's going. You know, I know it's going to happen. Um, but if it's a surprise and it's something new, then it's oh my god, the boat's the boat's wet. I got to cut coring out of it. It's been like that for 20 years. It's going to be like that for another 20 years. And if you handle it that way and present it that way and control the message, then it's not a surprise. You set reasonable expectations. And with a buyer, you, you, you know, what I try to do is 
you know, when you when you get a survey, it's listen. We're not we're not doing we're not talking about light bulbs and hose clamps. Mm -hmm. So we want to focus on, you know, oh, well, survey adjustments. Is it safety related? Is it a major piece of mechanical equipment that doesn't work that should work? Um, or is there a, a structural deficiency? Let's stick to those three big points, and all the rest of it is, hey, it's a clean, well-kept, pre-owned boat, what we expected, what we talked about going into it. We don't beat people up just to beat them up. You know, I'll fight for you, but here's where we need our focus. Be stressed so that when we get into the mud, like this is where we hang our hat. These are the items we need to be focused on. Set those expectations, communicate it early, and you'll get to the closing table. This is why this guy's the number one HMI salesperson. Not number one. <laughs> so, but anyway, but going back to Mike's original point, wouldn't it be nice if you had control over knowing what those things were before you get to survey? So then you're setting that expectation. Like, just so you know, uh, the four deck has moisture in it or whatever. So then it's not as much of a surprise if you can control that. But to Mike's point, that's excellent. It's all about controlling the message to the customer, assuming that you feel it's the right thing to do and, and they're still doing the right thing for themselves. Yes, George. One of the things, Eric, that I do, and, and one of my roles is to train uh, new marine surveyors. Uh, I teach up at Chapman School of Seamanship. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I, taught, I teach them is uh, two points. One is immediately get on the phone after you walk off the boat with the client to discuss and to, to verbalize. Some of these things, uh, some of these issues like moisture, um, they will go into the report in a very uh, technical manner. So discussing the severity and discussing options on how to address the, the issue. Going back to a cord boat, understand, uh, the surveyors are being trained to reach out to the manufacturers to identify what type of coring. If it's balsa, if it's plywood, we've got an issue with moisture. If it's Divinacel, Clegicel, or one of these cross-linked PVC cores, who cares? Mm -hmm. It's just weight. It, it doesn't, doesn't diminish the fiberglass. It doesn't impact the structural or strength of the hull. So now we can, we can work with that. So, to, so the, the surveyors, we, we try and tell them to, to be, not only to, to just survey the boat, but to be knowledgeable in, in uh, and be able to talk to some of these issues uh, about, about the impact of what you're finding uh, and, and maybe discuss what are methods to address it. Uh, again, the methods are not gonna be spelled out in the report uh, in the findings and recommendations, but to talk about different options that exist, different solutions that may be available uh, to, to help the, uh, the buyer understand that, that this is not necessarily a deal breaker, that, that this is, is in fact common amongst boats. Good points. Yes, sir. Uh, I just wanna mention one other thing that I think sellers can do um, at the listing stage to prepare for the sale that I think is also helpful to surveyors, and that is uh, make sure that you have copies of all the, the vessels, documents, and certificates, and that they're all up to date. Uh, make sure you have titles and registrations for the tenders and toys, if there are registered tenders and toys. Uh, take photos of the labels on the vessel's engines. All of that information is very helpful to lawyers who are doing a sale, but um, it, I think it can be also, also be helpful to, to facilitate the survey. Um, and then one thing I wanted to mention on the buyer side, for, for lawyers, a lot of times what we have to do is manage the buyer's expectations, particularly if it's a first-time buyer or a first-time buyer for a yacht of a, of a larger size. They can be shocked to see a survey report with 20 or 30 pages of, of recommendations. And we have to explain to them ahead of time that a boat can survey very well and still have a report with 20 pages of recommendations. And to George's point, sometimes the recommendations doesn't always come across in the report which is serious. Something can seem innocuous and actually be very serious. Something can seem serious and actually be easily fixed. So to have a surveyor who can communicate with the buyer and explain which things are real issues um, and, and which ones are, are things that you might expect to see in a boat of this age, that can be very helpful because these buyers, a lot of times they see a survey report, uh, you know, a thorough survey report, and they just flip out. 
um, and you have to explain to them that no, this is not this is not bad. Yeah, you yeah. let them know ahead of time there could be a two three hundred item punch list, but there's really fifteen things we need to focus on. Yeah, good the point. The rest of it is, you know, clean pre-owned boat stuff. Yeah, just trying to keep it under control. That's okay. So that that kind of leads into the next point. So we've done getting the uh, the boat ready for survey, getting the um, the seller ready, getting the buyer ready. Uh, I'd like to ask David how we get it to close. And one thing we talked about, um, and I can assure you this never happens at Smith Yacht Sales where we have to extend deals because we're beyond the dates. But there are things that happen in deals. Just like we talked about, there's um, a 200 thing punch list the person maybe wants to move forward, but the insurance company's asking for these things to be taken care of before the, they close on this all, a litany of things. But from your perspective, David, how, how do you now, once we've been through that survey and the buyer says, I want this boat, how do we get there? Well, I think the, the first step is making sure that you give yourself enough time. Um, it, it's not just about finding a time when the boat can be hauled and when you can do the trial run. You need to give the surveyor time to prepare a written report, which on a large yacht can take up to a week. Um, sometimes there's a, there's a whole team of surveyors. There might be an engine surveyor, an electrical surveyor who also have to prepare written reports. Um, usually you take oil samples from the engine and, and those get sent off for analysis and it can take a few days to get those results. So you wanna make sure that you have plenty of time after the survey is done on board the yacht to get all the results back and digest them and, and prepare a sensible response. Uh, now, in terms of going from a survey report uh, to a conditional acceptance and then on to a closing, you have this list of recommendations, and I think the first thing you have to do, and this is something that Mike mentioned, is be discriminating. I've had buyers who just want to staple the survey report to the acceptance and ask the seller to fix everything, and that never goes over well. Mm -hmm. You have to focus on the things that are serious, uh, the starter safety items that are going to prevent the boat from being insured. Um, if there are things that are going to significantly affect how the buyer is able to use and enjoy the boat, maybe you add those. But you want to be discriminating about which items you're asking the seller to address. And then you have to think about how is the seller going to address them. And I think generally you have three options. You can either fix it before closing, you can ask for a price adjustment, or you can do an extra holdback. Um, there are some things that can't be fixed before closing, and, uh, and then you decide how to address those. My opinion, personally, is that generally a price adjustment is better. Um, and the reason why is that there's a cost to doing a holdback. Somebody has to paper it up. Somebody has to think about what are the conditions for the release of the holdback. Somebody has to actually administer the holdback and, and pay out the money. And usually that's, we're those people, the lawyers, and we charge by the hour. And there's a cost for that. And so unless there's a lot of uncertainty um, about what the cost is going to be, usually I think it makes more sense to just pick a number. Maybe it's more, maybe it's less. But um, there's, there's no sort of overhead associated with that. And just leave it up to the buyer. Just leave it up to the buyer to, to deal with it after closing, however he thinks best. The other thing that's really important, once you've decided which items are going to be addressed and how you want the seller to address them, is for there to be communication before you present the conditional acceptance. So communication between the brokers is really important. The worst thing you can do is present a conditional acceptance with all these conditions and the seller is blindsided. You do that on the closing date with no time left for negotiation and that's a recipe for disaster. So you want to give yourself enough time, you want to be very discriminating about what you put on the list, think carefully about how the items should be addressed, and then make sure there's communication between the brokers so the seller isn't shocked when he gets the conditional acceptance. And how much time are you allocating for, uh, what's the normal sales cycle of a deal? Well, I mean, when, if somebody comes to us and they want to present an offer, we typically say, I mean, depending on how busy things are and, and how available we think surveyors are going to be, you want at least, I would say, two, three, four weeks before an acceptance date to make sure you have time to schedule a survey, get the boat hauled, get the survey report back, decide how to respond. And then in, term of the, in terms of the time between the acceptance date and closing, we always say one week minimum, two weeks is better because if it's less than one week, we can do it, but that means that we're going to be doing things to prepare for closing before the boat is accepted. So if the boat is not accepted, that means wasted effort. Mm -hmm. And if the client understands that and he's willing to spend that money knowing that it'll be wasted if the boat isn't accepted, then that's fine. But really, you don't want to start preparing for closing until you know you have an accepted boat. Okay. Ten days, two weeks is, you know, with the challenges that we face with uh, the insurance markets down here, um, you need time if there's financing. And, uh, and post-survey, you know, always take the money. 
always, you know, if you want to make it to the closing table, I mean, if you want to, yeah, if you want to close the boat, um, don't try to negotiate out a, a 28 on punch list in the boatyard with three different vendors. You're saying do a, a price adjustment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we've all been there too many times where, and when, when I'm suggesting that to my buyer, he said, well, what if, what if uh, we fix something and it, it, it's more money? I said, well, at least our trusted vendors are the ones fixing it. We, you know, uh, we can all assume that the buyers are good people, mm -hmm. but you know, we don't need that item checked off the punch list with uh, bubble gum and duct tape and a quick picture of it fixed. You know, let's use our trusted people. Let's take the money. If it runs a little, this one, this item might run a little bit over. This one might run a little bit under. It'll all even itself out in the end. Um, massive delays when you're dealing with, you know, Fix it. fixing. Fix it. Yeah. fixing punch list items. I mean, if the punch list is that extensive and it needs that much in repairs, reject the boat, let's go buy another boat. Good points. All right, so to stay on track here, we're going till 9.45. We were trying to allocate about 10 minutes for questions. So take advantage of these guys because they are a panel of experts. What do we got, Paul, yes. Uh, talking about pre-purchase surveys, um, one of the things that I've run into is the assignment of that survey. If the buyer chooses to do that pre at listing, uh, and then the buyer wants to, due to financing reasons, have that be in the um, report, can it be assigned to the buyer? A lot of the times I've run into problems where they'll say, no, you have to now do another survey in the name of the buyer. That's a great question. Yeah, good question. And we see that all the time. All the time, and it's, yeah. it's, it's a problem, so that's why people aren't doing the pre-purchase surveys because of that. Pre-listing survey, sorry. Yeah, Yeah. so I think uh, what we're seeing is that if you have that survey from, for somebody else, and it's recent, it could have been a week ago, maybe it was somebody that canceled the deal, can you reassign it? to a new client, I, with the person's permission, would they sell it? Yes, sir. Let me start off first by, by one, one of the issues that comes up is that report is the intellectual property of the surveyor. Copyright laws apply. So if they do the survey for the seller as a pre-listing survey, that's for the, for the seller's use only. Any sale beyond that is breaking copyright law. Uh, second of all is um, most surveyors are gonna be hesitant from a legal perspective and, and, and covering their own behinds to allow you to, to, to pass that on because nobody knows what's happened once the minute they walk off the boat. That survey report says that, that as of the moment they step foot off of the boat, this is the condition. It makes no warranties or claims as to what the condition is a week, 10, 20, 30 days later. So you're, you're unfortunately, it's a, uh, in, in the society we live in today, we, we're, we're too litigious and, and so at the end of the day, you're just asking for trouble trying to, trying to pass that along. So maybe somebody could buy it for informational purposes, but they aren't gonna necessarily use it for their own survey. Yeah, most of the survey reports will say that this is, this is for use by this individual for the purposes of purchasing or for selling the boat, okay. and it's not assignable to anybody else. David. So I think there, there are two situations here. One is the situation where the seller has done a pre-listing survey and then is offering that to buyer saying, you don't have to do your own survey, you can save 20 grand in a haul out, we've done the survey for you. And in that case, even if the seller has negotiated an assignable license with the surveyor and so the buyer is legally entitled to rely on it, as a seller, as a, as a lawyer or a, or a selling broker, we would tell that person, you need to go out and get your own survey. Mm -hmm. um, you, you need somebody who's, who's working for you, you need somebody who's looking at the boat now, um, and certainly an insurer or a lender is going to be very reluctant to, to rely on a survey that was commissioned ahead of time by the seller. The second issue is another buyer has just done a survey and rejected the vessel and now is, is offering to sell that, that survey to you. And in that case, generally, it, as, uh, as George said, it's the case that the surveyor owns the survey, the, the person who commissioned the survey has a license, but that license is not assignable. And so unless you go and get permission from the surveyor, 
um, to, to, to sell it to someone else. It's something that happens in the industry all the time. Sur survey reports are sold, but legally, that's unless the, the license is assignable, it's, it's a violation of copyright law. Wow, that's really important. See, I, I told you guys I'm a greenhorn, and I just learned a new thing. I always thought the survey was the property of the person that paid to have it done, so I, I learned a new thing today. All right. Uh, when, I get, when I get those questions yes. about, um, you know, you have a, a listing and they say, uh, it, is there a, has there been a recent survey? Um, the canned reply is always, no, there hasn't been a recent survey. You know, you want to do your own survey. And in my experience, it's, it's a trap. So any, any survey that you share with a potential buyer, they're only going to focus on the survey findings and the negatives of the survey findings. Mm -hmm. So they're going to go in and say, before they even spend a dime, before they even commit to the process, you're giving them a look behind the curtain, which they're going to focus on the negative. So don't do it. Like Even if there is a survey available, it's not theirs, and I wouldn't share it. When I recommend doing in-house surveys, it's not for anyone else's benefit. It's for our benefit, for, for my benefit, for the, list, for the owner's benefit to get ahead of it. We're not going to disclose all the deficiencies, half of which have already been fixed, to some guy trolling for information or in the beginning stages. Um, because they're just going to focus on the negatives. You're going to give them a copy of the survey, and, um, and it won't make it any further than that, because that, they're going to go through the survey findings and say, well, th this boat's not perfect. Oh, I, I don't want this boat. So it's, it's, a, it's a trap. Don't fall for it. That buyer was from New York. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, by the way, we have like two minutes left yeah. for questions. So, so, so. so la last, last com on, comment on that also is think about it from this perspective. We've all seen instances of stray current corrosion going on, and I've got tail shafts that are two inches in diameter, stainless steel, that in six days were destroyed. Um, lightning strikes. We're in the lightning capital of the world just about down here in, in South Florida. And so between, the time, between that selling survey and the, buyer, and the buyer seeing it, was there a nearby lightning strike that caused electrical damage? It, it, there's just too many unknowns with it. In the interim, I get it. Okay, any, uh, yes, Paul, yes, sir. Hi, gentlemen, uh, great, great uh, panel. Uh, George, you kind of brushed over it a little bit, but as a selling broker, you know, we always encourage our clients to be there, be available for the day of the survey. And you were talking about explaining technical mm -hmm. issues, which it's great for the broker to be able to step back and hear it directly from the survey that they hired. Can you just talk to your feelings about um, having a, you know, a sidekick during the survey? I mean, I know it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's definitely a double-edged sword having the owner there. Um, with larger vessels, quite my experience has typically been we have a captain that's been hired to manage and be the uh, operational expert for that particular boat. On smaller boats, quite often I've had uh, the owner there, and you're right, it gets to be a little bit uh, uncomfortable if you've got a boat that is, go that is starting to show uh, undervalue, uh, or there's a lot of significant uh, structural or mechanical issues, equipment not working, that does become a little bit uncomfortable. But from my personal opinion, I've, I don't mind having the, the owner there. In fact, I prefer to have somebody there. Uh, again, we, te we train the surveyors. Your role is not to sit there and turn switches and knobs and pull buttons uh, or push buttons. Your job is to examine and verify that the, the boat is in, in compliance with whatever pl applicable standards uh, are for that vessel. Uh, so your focus is that it shouldn't be testing uh, or, or actually figuring out how to run equipment. Um, many of us do uh, just from experience and everything else, but, but ideally we would prefer to have someone there who knows the, knows the boat or the yacht and is able to demonstrate it for us. On the, on the bigger boats, you're going to have the captain there. And in my opinion, avoid the owner being there at all costs. 
bigger boats, medium-sized boats, smaller boats, <laughs> personalities. Joking. You got people that just, they're picking apart his boat. Yeah. So mm -hmm. certain personalities will, can clash. Yeah. Um, on Good the point. smaller boats, you know, where you don't have a captain, maybe the owner has to be the guy to run it. Um, but, um, you know, I would always recommend hiring a captain. The seller needs to stay away. Don't get the buyers and sellers together. Um, very, sometimes you have the, like a super passionate, really knowledgeable seller that you know, he knows the boat better than you. Um, and you know he'll be an asset because he's that good of a guy and he loves his boat that much. In those rare circumstances, I know he's gonna be an asset to the sales process and I would encourage him to be there, but nine times out of 10, you don't want those guys on the same boat all day long while they pick apart his boat. Got it, all right. I hate to cut it short, but we're kind of over time. Um, again, thanks to these guys. Let's give them a round of applause. Great job, lots of knowledge up here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, bro.